Mr. Ziadu Beidat, uh, representing the Secretary General of the Ministry of Planning and International Cooperation, Your Excellency Asma Khader, Chair of the Advisory Board of SIGI. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, good morning. I am Alberto Natta from the Office of the United Nations Resident and Humanitarian Coordinator in Jordan. And first of all, I really would like to thank you all for coming today. Um, many of you already have been involved in the post-2015 consultation since 2012, uh, but today is quite a golden opportunity to bring all different stakeholders together and uh, take stock of what has been done so far and try to uh, nurture the discussion on the way forward and on the implementation of, of the agenda. So this morning we will start with the opening remarks by Ms. Costanza Farina, UNESCO representative and chair of the post-2015 focus group, followed by the opening remarks of Mr. Ziado Beidat on behalf of uh, Dr. Saleh Harabsh, Secretary General of the Ministry of Planning and International Cooperation. The rest of the morning will be basically divided in two parts. In the first one we will give you the key updates and uh, outcomes of the post-2015 process uh, at the global level, and then we will narrow it down to the national level. First, to tell you what happened so far in Jordan and what are the outcomes. But then, as I said, like, it would be good to start discussing uh, with an open, frank discussion on the means of implementation, on the partnership opportunities that we have uh, in Jordan. So I would like now to invite uh, Ms. Costanza Farina to deliver her opening remarks. Thanks, Costanza. Good morning. Good morning to everybody and uh, welcome once, once again. Uh, Mr. Ziad Obedat, um, representing His Excellency Salah uh, al Kharabshe, Secretary General of the Ministry of Planning and International Cooperation, and Your Excellency Asma Khader, Chair of the Advisory Board Tadamon Siji. Dear colleagues, all of you, friends and, and uh, participants, uh, it is a real pleasure for me to welcome you here, all of you, for this uh, post-2015 uh, stakeholder meeting. I'm happy to see such a large audience and varied with uh, lots of diversity. And I'm particularly happy to see people, uh, colleagues coming from the government, uh, as well as from the civil society organization and many young people on which we, uh, we rely a lot. This is, uh, for me, I think this is a unique opportunity, actually, for all of us to pave the way for a successful, something wrong, maybe? Is the, is the translation working? Yes? Okay. I was saying this is for, for us, I think, is a unique opportunity to pave the way for a successful implementation of the post-2015 development agenda in Jordan. Allow me to thank once more Dr. Saleh Harabshe and the Ministry of Planning International Cooperation for collaborating in the organization of this event and for manifesting such a vivid interest in keeping the strong momentum created by the post-2015 dialogues carried out in Jordan since 2012. Allow me also to thank all the panelists, which we'll be hearing uh, in, in a little while, uh, who have accepted to be here with us today. They are going to share with us their experience, their wisdom, their insights on how we can create effective partnerships to ensure ownership, participation, and accountability of all stakeholders when putting in place a development framework that will follow the Millennium Development Goals. What world do we want to live in? And what future do we want for our children? These are the questions which are leading the global conversation that has started on the new development agenda for the post-2015. 2015 is a, the year of global action. It's an historical opportunity for the world. Member States will gather for the summit in September this year to determine a transformative agenda that will improve lives and bring prosperity while protecting the planet. As we will we'll be discussing later on in the morning, the proposed 17 Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, 
will be the main component of the post-2015 development agenda and will contain 169 ambitious targets. A few considerations to illustrate this last point. As you may realize, this is a much broader and more integrated set of goals that the whole world will be presented with. Second, the, this is a truly universal agenda, relevant to all countries. It seeks to combine aspirational global targets as well as country-specific targets to be set nationally. Efforts have, have also been put in place to measure the goals and the targets in, in a much bolder, transparent, and effective way. This is what we called the data revolution. Fourth point, the set of stakeholders who will be accountable for this agenda is also much broader. We all know that the success of the post-2015 development agenda will depend on more than ambitions and aspirations only. It will require commitments at all levels from political leadership, multilateral organizations, civil society, the private sector, and in reality from all other stakeholders. And last point, but the most revolutionary, is the way the goals were developed. Rather than having an expert initiative shaping the agenda, a truly multi-stakeholder process was put in place some time ago. Let me reiterate that consultations around the world on the post-2015 have been supported by the United Nations with the participation of citizens, civil society, academia, and many others. I want to refer quickly to uh, what the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said in this regard, and I quote, through this exercise, the global consultation with all the stakeholders, the United Nations was determined to tap into the spirit of the first words of its founding charter, we the peoples, to say that it is the people who determine the goals and it is the people who will have the accountability to implement them. Since 2012 in Jordan, the United Nations country team through its post-2015 focus group engaged with a number of partners in this process. The group was able to facilitate some 60 events directly involving around 3,000 people from a wide range of stakeholders, men, women, boys, girls, from urban and rural areas from the north, center, and the south of the country. It is very encouraging to realize that all stakeholders in Jordan were very enthusiastic to contribute to the future they want. The messages from the first round of national consultations in Jordan represent a mix of priorities which confirm, first, the urgency of addressing quality education to establish robust ties with the labor market. Second, the need for a more inclusive approach to address economic and social disparities, and third, the critical importance of environmental protection while water scarcity was recognized as alarming. The consultations also revealed a huge demand for a deeper involvement, not only in the design of the development agenda, but also in its future implementation. Change cannot be made to people, it has to be made with and by people if a lasting impact is to be achieved. In the dialogues on the means of implementations carried out last year, civil society expressed the firm desire to have a stronger voice and advocated for a more proactive role in the implementation of the future development framework. As a CSO representative in IRBIT put it, there are three roles for the civil society in the post-2015 framework. First, policy advice to the government. Second, implementation of development projects. Third, regular monitoring of progress. Today, let us discuss how we can make this happen. Let us be open, frank, but especially creative in proposing ideas and solutions for effective partnership between different stakeholders. And here now, I want to talk about youth. 
young people often face the brunt of exclusion, unemployment, and social marginalization. Yet, at the same time, there are an incredible source of new ideas that represent a worthwhile reservoir of implementation capacity and a real force of positive social progress. The secret sits on how they can be best mobilized, how they can contribute a positive role in social advancement, and how they can make their voice heard. More on the global level, the new uh, transformative agenda will require the international community to be fit for purpose, and the United Nations is certainly no exception. A UN system which is fit for purpose to deliver on the post-2015 agenda is one which is innovative, agile, inclusive, and result-oriented, guided by human rights and international norms, and working effectively with partners. Emphasis will be placed this time on using data and evidence more effectively and transparently, and on, on developing greater analytical capacities to address inequalities, risks, and vulnerabilities. In doing so, the United Nations system is committed to working more collaboratively to leverage the expertise and capacities of its funds, programs, and agencies in support of sustainable development. The UN country team in Jordan is committed to provide coherent support to national stakeholders to implement their new post-2015 development strategies. Part of this support could be the organization of a series of thematic briefing training sessions preparing for action during this year, possibly in collaboration with the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNITAR and of course based on the endorsement and collaboration of the Ministry of Planning and International Cooperation. We also warmly welcome the establishment of the post-2015 coalition led by Tadamon CG. It is, as will be discussed later today, we encourage that this coalition be, be expanded and consolidated to embrace even more social um, civil society organizations. Let me conclude now with a recent quote from the UNESCO Director General, Mrs. Irina Bokova, which said, and I quote, our collective vision is clear. We live in a new age of limits in terms of resources and sustainable practices to ensure the survival of our planet. This means we must make far more of the boundless energy of human ingenuity and knowledge. We must realize the full power of innovation and creativity and the potential of all to craft new solutions that are inclusive, just, and sustainable. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Ms. Farina. And just let me add on your words uh, to thank also our colleagues from the United Nations, from the, especially from the post-2015 focus group, for the extended support uh, throughout the consultation and during the organization of this event. Uh, I think this shows the UN, the UN joint commitment to support the implementation of the post-2015 agenda. Uh, let me now invite uh, Mr. Ziadu Beidat, uh, representing the Secretary General of the Ministry of Planning and International Cooperation. Thank you. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سعادة السيدة كوستان زافارينا رئيسة فريق أجندة التنمية لما بعد العام 2015 في الأردن صاحبة المعالي السيدة أسماء خضر أصحاب العطوفة والسعادة السيدات والسادة أسعد الله صباحكم إنه لمن دواعي السرور والغبطة أن نلتقي في هذا الصباح الطيب المبارك الذي تناقشون فيه أحد المواضيع الحيوية والأساسية في عملية المشاورات لأجندة التنمية ما بعد العام 2015 لما لذلك من أهمية كبيرة للأردن والعالم أجمع واسمحوا لي أن أرحب بالمشاركين والمشاركات الكرام في هذا الاجتماع 
الذي لا يساورني الشك في أن الحوارات ستكون شيقة وثرية في الأفكار التي سيتم طرحها والنتائج التي ستخرج بها كما أرجو أن أتقدم بجزيل الشكر والتقدير لسعادة الممثل المقيم للأمم المتحدة وكافة منظمات الأمم المتحدة العاملة في الأردن والإقليمية لإتاحتهم هذه الفرصة للتباحث والتشارك وبحضور كافة الشركاء من أجل التوصل إلى رؤية مشتركة حول المستقبل الذي نريد لقد مثلت الأهداف الإنمائية للألفية وغاياتها منذ إعلانها في العام 2000 أحد الأركان الرئيسية المهمة في التنمية ولأول مرة جمعت هذه الأهداف كافة دول العالم نحو رؤية مشتركة هدفها الأساسي الإنسان وقد تم صياغة هذه الأهداف بوضوح وموضوعية وعلى نحو يمكن الدول من قياسها ونحن في الأردن ومنذ الإعلان قمة الألفية في العام 2000 ولأهمية هذه الأهداف والتي تتناغم وتنسجم في مجملها مع الأهداف الوطنية لتحقيق تنمية اقتصادية واجتماعية وسياسية شاملة حيث كان الأردن من أوائل الدول التي عملت مع برنامج الأمم المتحدة الإنماية على إدماج أهداف وغايات الألفية في الخطط والبرامج الوطنية بالإضافة إلى وضع آلي لقياس مدى التحقق من خلال تبني مؤشرات الأداء في هذا المجال إن تتبع الأهداف والغايات للألفية على المستوى الوطني وفق البيانات كشف عن إنجازات كبيرة قد تحققت سواء كان ذلك في مكافحة الفقر والجوع وتعميم التعليم الأساسي وتعزيز المساواة بين الجنسين وتحسين صحة الأمهات والأطفال وضمان الاستدامة البيئية وبناء شراكات من أجل التنمية وقد تراوحت النتائج إما أنه تحقق أو في طور التحقق قريبا كما لوحظ أن الإنجاز كان سريعا في السنوات الأولى للإعلان ثم مال إلى التباطؤ أو الثبات في بعض الأحيان وهذا سببه التحديات التي واجهت الأردن أثناء التنفيذ والتي تتعلق بالهجرات من الدول المجاورة نتيجة النزاعات في المنطقة وكذلك الآثار السلبية للأزمة المالية العالمية وانطلاقا من إطار عمل الأهداف الإنمائية الألفية التي تنتهي هذا العام 2015 والتي شكلت خطوة مهمة نحو صياغة تفكير جديد حول التنمية وكذلك الحاجة إلى الانتقال إلى أبعاد تنموية شاملة مستدامة تحقق الكرامة للجميع فقد انطلقت عملية المشاورات للتنمية ما بعد العام 2015 وما اختيار الأردن ضمن الدول التي ستجري فيها المشاورات خلال الأعوام السابقة إنما يدل على مكانة الأردن الدولية والدور الفاعل ضمن هذه المنظومة وبرعاية الأمم المتحدة ولكذلك لا بد من أن ننوه إلى مشاركة جلالة الملكة رانيا العبدالله المعظمة ضمن الفريق رفيع المستوى الذي اختاره الأمين العام للأمم المتحدة في تحديد خارطة الطريق لأجندة التنمية وقد حرصت الحكومة ومن خلال وزارة التخطيط والتعاون الدولي وبالتعاون مع القائمين على إجراء تلك المشاورات في الأردن من منظمات الأمم المتحدة على دعم ومشاركة المجتمع الأردني بكافة أطيافه وفئاته من شباب وقطاع خاص ومؤسسات مجتمع مدني وقطاع عام وصولا إلى الأولويات التي تهمهم خلال المرحلة القادمة وهنا لابد من الإشارة إلى فريق العمل من منظمات الأمم المتحدة القطرية والإقليمية في الأردن التي عملت بجهد كبير ومهنية عالية على تنظيم تلك المشاورات سواء كان ذلك بعقد ورش العمل أو الندوات أو المحاضرات أو المواقع التفاعلية وكذلك الجهد الذي بذلوه في تذليل كافة العقبات وتسهيل مهمة المشاورات إن اختيار الأردن لمرحلة ثانية من إجراء المشاورات من بين ثمانية دول يدل أيضا على مدى التفاعل والمشاركة الذي حصل في المرحلة الأولى خاصة المجتمع المدني الذي كان حاضرا في كافة اللقاءات ولدوره في وضع وصياغة الأولويات التي تهم المواطن بالدرجة الأساس ونحن نلتقي اليوم للوقوف على نتائج تلك المشاورات ومناقشة آليات التنفيذ لقد شارك الأردن وضمن مجموعة السبع وسبعين في بلورة موقف مشترك حول الأهداف المقترحة حاليا السبعة وكذلك شارك مع الدول العربية على بلورة موقف موحد 
ويشارك الأردن ضمن الاجتماعات الحكومية لأجندة التنمية لما بعد العام 2015 في نيويورك لبلورة رؤية مشتركة عالمية تحقق الأمن والسلام والرخاء للعالم السيدات والسادة إننا نتطلع وبعد إعلان أجندة التنمية إلى البقاء على نفس الزخم والإرادة نحو تحمل الجميع لمسؤولياتهم وأن نعمل وبمشاركة الجميع من منظمات مجتمع مدني وقطاع خاص وقطاع عام وشباب على إيجاد آليات للتنفيذ والمساءلة والرصد والتقييم على كافة المستويات المحلية والعربية والعالمية وإننا سنعمل على بناء نظام معلومات وطني يعتمد على بيانات إحصائية دقيقة في الوقت المناسب تمكن أصحاب المصلحة من الاطلاع عليها وتحليلها والخروج بتوصيات تعزز أو تقوم خطط التنفيذ اسمحوا لي في الختام أن أتقدم بالشكر والتقدير إلى كافة المشاركين في إجراء المشاورات بكافة مواقعهم وكذلك القائمين والميسرين من منظمات الأمم المتحدة العاملة في الأردن آملين أن تستمر مثل هذه اللقاءات والتعاون والتنسيق للمساهمة في تحسين مستوى ونوعية حياة المواطن وكلنا ثقة بإمكانية تعزيز قدراتنا ومواصلة مسيرتنا على طريق تحقيق التنمية المستدامة بإذن الله في ظل توجيهات صاحب الجلالة الملك عبد الله الثاني بن الحسين حفظه الله ورعاه المؤمن بقدرتنا على تخطي العقبات والتغلب على التحديات لتحقيق الأهداف التنموية وصولا إلى تحسين مستوى معيشة المواطنين جميعا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thanks a lot, Mr. Abedat. Um, now, before moving to the presentation of what is the post-2015 agenda, we'll just want to break a bit and show you a very short video, which basically tries to summarize what has been done in Jordan on the post-2015 since 2012 uh, until basically uh, September, October last year. سؤال واحد شو العالم اللي بدكم اياه استبيان عالمي ماي وورد تعرف بس الخيارات الخيارات اللي ممكن تغير حياتك And we would like to thank the United Nations for giving us the opportunity to make our voices heard. And to actively contribute to expand the dialogue on the post-2015 agenda in our communities. المؤسسات المجتمع المدني والمحلي ممكن تضغط بطريقه او باخرى على الحكومه لتغيير سياساتها. Let's do it the other way around. Let's do it this time from bottom up rather than from uh, up down. ما في شراكه حقيقيه بين هاي القطاعات. ما في حدا او مؤسسه لحالها بتقدر تشتغل في اي موضوع. 
بدنا تشارك تشارك من الجهات الحقيقية التعليم العالي في مشكلة واحد اثنين ثلاث شايفينها بيشتغلوا فيها وإحنا بندعم ومن قوي ومن ساعد أن تكون وجهة نظر حاضرة تطبيقا وليس فقط نظريا وظيفة مؤسسات المجتمع المدني تكون الدور الرقابي نشجع على ذلك في الأردن المجتمع المدني لديه دور أيضا في تحديد الأهداف في الإسهام في تنفيذها وأيضا من ثم الرقابة عليها أفضل طريقة لشركات الحكومة مع المجتمع المدني هي فتح المجال وتسهيل العمل المجتمعي أو المدني من خلال زي ما أنا أشرت للمبادرات الشبابية Apologies, we had some sound issues. All right, then um, I just wanted now, before we break and we go into a more uh, interactive session, just to give you uh, the background on the post-2015, mainly at the global level. So what's the post-2015? Uh, now it has been almost three years since uh, the UN and all its partners started the consultation on the process. Um, but just to have a step back, we want to go back in the year 2000, when member states um, agreed on eight Millennium Development Goals. So since we mentioned them uh, several times this morning, I just want to uh, mention one by one very quickly. So the eight Millennium Development Goals were eradicate poverty and hunger, achieve universal primary education, promote gender equality and empower women, reduce child mortality, improve maternal health, combat HIV, IDS, and other diseases, ensure environmental sustainability, and develop a global partnership for development. So these goals, as we said, will basically expire in 2015, at the end of 2015. So for now, we still need to accelerate our efforts in trying to achieve uh, the Millennium Development Goals. But at the same time, uh, currently there are extensive uh, negotiations and consultation around the globe on defining the new set of development goals, the new goals. So, as it's mentioned in the second column, basically since 2012, uh, the UN, at mul with a multi-dimensional, multi-layer approach, uh, carried out consultations. So we are talking at the global level, at the regional level, at the national level. And basically, the, the questions that we were asking to all stakeholders were, so what is the world you want? What are the priorities that matter for your future? And how can we implement the priorities that, for example, you suggested? Um, all the input received from the different processes fed into, we can say, in two uh, milestone reports. Uh, one is the Secretary General uh, synthesis report, it's called The Road to Dignity by 2030, and it's available today, both English and Arabic, so I invite you to take a copy of it. Um, and the second one is the uh, Open Working Group proposal on the Sustainable Development Goals. And this is the proposal that basically sets out the 17 goals and 169 targets. So now, uh, I will go into details later on, but basically from now until September, member states will keep negotiating to arrive at the global summit and agree on the post-2015 agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals by September uh, 2015. So before going into the details of the agenda, I just would like to outline some of the key principles uh, that characterizes the post-2015 agenda. And first of all is the importance of promoting ownership by making the process open, inclusive, transparent, and as we said, to try and 
involve as many stakeholders as possible. The second one is forging new connection between people, partnerships. And we said in Jordan we, we discussed the partnership between civil society, but in other countries they discussed partnership with the private sector, for example. And then this is really an advancement compared to the MDGs because the, the precondition for development, it is recognized that should be integration of peace, security, and governments. And we will see later on that this has been reflected in one of the goals of the 17 goals. And last, um, the post 2015 agenda should carry on the unfinished business of the MDGs, but at the same time expand uh, with other priority areas that haven't been acknowledged so far. So here they are, uh, 17 uh, sustainable development goals, proposed 17 sustainable development goals, plus three pillars at the end. Now, just for you to know, this is not the exact definition that you can find the proposal. It was just to fit the, the slide. Uh, we put some copies on the table. Maybe some of you do not have, but uh, we'll make sure we'll provide it later on. Um, so just to go quickly through them, not one by one, but just to try and see. For example, from goal one to goal five, it is more or less the, the business uh, already uh, encompassed in the MDGs. But there is a difference, and the difference is that it's no more only about quantity. We don't just want to see achieving primary education. We want to see achieving quality primary education. This is an example, but it applies to all. And, and then uh, we can see definitely many, let's call them new areas, for example, there is one on sustainable growth, employment, decent work. Um, there is one on peaceful and inclusive society. And within the targets, if you then read, it's basically rule of law, governance, which is something that was not included in the MDGs. And as you can definitely see that there are many, those who are called green goals. Um, as I said before, in the MDGs, there was only the sustainable development definition. Uh, actually, it was environmental sustainability. Uh, here we can see the goals that are much uh, in a breakdown. So water, energy, um, climate change, sustainable ocean rivers, uh, ter terrestrial ecosystem, forest. So when we, uh, and then of course the, the three last pillars um, that, that show how, for example, it is important to improve the quality of data and the analysis on the data. Uh, the financing for development, uh, we have 17 goals, we need financing for 17 goals. It's quite a, a huge resources that are needed. And then technology, so the important, since we are moving towards, these goals will be from 2016 to 2030. We need to ensure that technology, new technology is incorporated in the implementation of the goals. Now, with a set of uh, 17 goals, some countries and I mean, you can, you can see the point, said, well, of course, they are all very much spelled out, it's, very, it's inclusive, but at the same time, how are we going to implement each and every one of them, and how are we going to advocate for all of them? This is mainly the position of, for example, among others, UK and Japan. Um, so the, the Secretary General of the United Nations, in his uh, synthesis report, he clustered the goals in six uh, called essential elements. And these are the ones uh, spelled out here. So basically, it's dignity, which includes basically end poverty and fight inequality. People, to ensure healthy lives, knowledge and inclusion of women and children. Prosperity, to grow a strong, inclusive and transformative economy. Planet, and so all the green goals that we mentioned earlier. Justice, to promote safe and peaceful societies and strong institutions. And then partnerships to catalyze global solidarity for sustainable development and, which is basically what we are going to discuss later on, the means of implementation at the country level, at the national level, to make the agenda work. So this proposal had a kind of uh, mixed reception from member states and probably uh, we'll see if, if this uh, attempt to reframe the goals will be successful or not in the next, uh, in the next months. So what, what's happening in the next month? Like I said earlier, now there are intergovernmental discussions happening at the global level. Um, 
these are facilitated by the re permanent representative in New York by, uh, of the, sorry, the Republic of Kenya and Republic of Ireland. They are meeting every month until July and each session has a specific topic. Um, but they will particularly, not only, but particularly focus on three, these three pillars um, that will be the outcomes of the global summit in, uh, 2000, in September 2015. So the first one is the political declaration. As you recall, the Millennium Declaration that was drafted in 2000, then similarly now, uh, member states will need to make a statement, make a declaration. And for now, um, there is agreement that this declaration should be visionary, um, ambitious, communicable, sharp. Some also say it should reflect the key principles of the post-2015 agenda, which is, for example, leaving no one behind. Uh, and this leaving no one behind is a principle that basically started from the very beginning, from the report of the high-level panel where Her Majesty Queen Rania was, was part of it. The second one is the Sustainable Development Goals and its targets. Um, as I said earlier, the proposal of the Open Working Group contains 17 goals and 169 targets. It is unlikely so far that these will change, um, although there are discussion about uh, what is called the technical proofing of the targets, because some might have been set below international standards. So they might be revised, but at the same time, if you go and revise the goals, you might break the, the balance that was created during the negotiation, the intergovernmental negotiations. So this is, um, will be discussed in the next few months. And, um, and of course also the UN Statistical Commission will prepare uh, the indicators for them to, to monitor the agenda. And the last one is the monitoring and review framework. Uh, now just to flag that the monitoring and review does not only need to happen at the global level, but it also will happen at the regional level and then probably the core will be at the national level. At the global level, there is a body now uh, which is called the High-Level Political Forum. Uh, again, this is something that will be uh, still discussed, but the idea is that this body, uh, this uh, uh, intergovernmental body, will uh, meet every four months to make a thorough review of the agenda, but also every month under the auspices of the Economic and Social Council ECOSOC, uh, to basically take stock of what has been done year by year. At the regional level, it will be probably a peer review, so countries evaluating other countries' performance. Uh, but then at the national level, of course, member state governments will be accountable because they are signatories of, of the declaration and of the goals. But at the same time, and this is one of the uh, principles of the agenda, is that everybody uh, should be accountable and this will happen only through uh, strong partnerships between uh, the government and other stakeholders who need to have a role in the implementation of the agenda. So this was in a very nutshell uh, a summary of the whole process at the global level. So now I open up for any question you might have on this and then we can uh, move on just focusing on, on Jordan. Yeah, please. Just use your mic, uh, Rowan. Sorry. Thank you, Alberto, for the presentation. I just have one question among, um, I know that you mentioned that there was no participation or negotiation with the private sector in Jordan. It's, it only included the civil society and the government. So why there, is, there was no private sector in the consultation? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, maybe we collect a couple and then I go back. Yeah. Uh, the youth role, actually, it was mentioned several times by Mr. Costanza and Mr. Obeidat. Uh, the question here is how? Is it only like by voting and participating in similar activities or with, in the implementation also? This is a very important question. Uh, and uh, you mentioned also that all the, uh, the stakeholders here are intergovernmental. So how can we involve the youth? Like, is it only by 
you know, there's several suggestions like uh, direct youth involvement or through NGOs or how exactly we can participate as youth in the implementation phase. Thank you. Right. Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, so as was suggesting by Mr. Obeidat, this last point we can leave it for the panel discussion, uh, if that's okay for you. I'll just touch upon the other two. First of all, uh, thanks, Rawan, for the, for the question. Uh, the private sector was not consulted in Jordan, um, not because we didn't want to, just because we were given six uh, uh, areas to focus on, uh, and uh, we realized that during the consultation in 2012-2013, the first round, that civil society was really enthusiastic in participating, especially uh, youth, and so we just wanted to capitalize on this enthusiasm and keep the momentum uh, and building on it. But this doesn't mean that there was no interest. Consultation on the private sector were carried out uh, in other countries. I can then share with you the report. And also recommendations on how to involve the private sector uh, were, um, were outlined. And so we can definitely also use it here in Jordan. Uh, on the youth, um, I mean, there's a whole chapter on youth because uh, it was uh, such a, a great participation during these consultations. Uh, but just to reply very quickly, is not only the, through the consultation, it, it is rather, I mean, indeed, through the implementation. Uh, we know, I mean, youth in Jordan, probably you have better figures than me, but they constitute more than half of the population. So we need to involve them, us, uh, in the implementation of the agenda as much as possible. And this is also what we maybe can discuss later on with the, with the panel and with other government uh, representatives. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, we go there and then. Just in case. Thank you for uh, the informative presentation. My question is very general. I looked at the list of goals that you uh, presented and I was thinking uh, are we putting extra burden on countries who are not meeting? The other, the, the previous goals, uh, I'll give you an example. Countries who, there are more than 73 countries in the world that are uh, not doing sufficient uh, work toward achieving uh, most of the Millennium Development Goals uh, previously. And uh, the list that, that you provided is really another burden on these countries. This is a comment. I'll give you an example. If you look at Afghanistan, Yemen, in the region, we will just find that they're not meeting not even uh, girls' education, which is a prerequisite in my uh, opinion to maternal health as well as maternal mortality, as well as uh, other uh, health promotion issues. Uh, my question is, in the uh, post-2015, do we have uh, processes for countries who are not meeting the eight uh, millennium development goal? Because we don't want to really uh, destroy what we achieved by focusing on extra burdens of look, looking at uh, uh, energy and ecosystems and things while still basic uh, indicators are not being met. So again, equity is one of your goals and equity requires that we help these countries. Are there steps for these countries or processes different than countries in the developed world, thanks. thanks. Can I also just, I forgot you earlier, can you just ask or introduce yourself before you speak so we just know uh, your name, sorry? Dr. Muntaha Garaybe, Secretary General for Jordanian Nursing Council at WGO, Consultant on Maternal Mortality and Human Resources for Health. Uh, we had a question on the back earlier. Sorry, can you speak closer to the mic, please? Can we try the other mic, maybe, on the side?
ذكرت حضرتك مناقشة المعايير الدولية أريد أن أسأل هل تتعلق بدمج حقوق الإنسان في الأهداف لما بعد 2015 أم معايير دولية تتعلق بأي موضوع أو بأي هدف وشكرا Thank you very much. So, to touch uh, on the first question, um, one of the key principles of this uh, post-2015 agenda is that it needs to um, stress the importance of specific country conditions. So, it's a universal agenda. It means that it applies to all, but at the same time, it very much takes into consideration uh, the context of each country. Um, I mean, this is how it needs to be implemented. So uh, we don't have to pick, so we have 17 goals, we don't have to pick one or two or three. We should try and implement as much as possible of them. But at the same time, each country needs to prioritize uh, the, the goals and the targets uh, that fit best uh, the context in the, in the country. This is how so far uh, it's, uh, it's been discussed at the, at the global level, but probably also when it will be uh, when it will come the final decision on the monitoring and review framework, maybe there will be some uh, specificities uh, and details uh, about it. Uh, on the other question, international standards, um, well, the issue of human rights, when you see the targets, uh, uh, it's, uh, oh, if I can go back, uh, where's that, okay. Um, human rights are more or less mainstreamed in many of them, um, especially number four, three, um, and five, I suppose. Uh, now, I don't know the 169 yet by heart. Uh, but uh, the idea is that uh, um, so far the targets are considered, I mean, in agreement with all countries. The issue of international standards applies uh, mainly to environmental goals where some of the targets uh, might be uh, a little bit below some of the international standards. But this is a very technical discussion, and again, probably they won't be even touched anymore just not to uh, break the, the balance struck during the intergovernmental discussions. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, Diana Al-Hadid from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Expatriates. Um, I just have a question because some stakeholders uh, claim that certain targets uh, contained in the OWG uh, report cannot be measured and consequently could be left out. Uh, and also there are some other views uh, uh, which call for the rearrangement or the repackaging of the SDGs. Uh, I mean, uh, this would create some confusion in terms of uh, balancing the three dimensions of sustainable development. I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on this. Yeah. Um, I mean, indicators and targets are critical. Um, and this is also probably why they were left at the, let's say, at the end of the process, because it's quite a technical matter. Now the Secretary General, around a couple of weeks ago, officially, uh, up, let's say, gave the mandate to the UN Statistical Commission to prepare the indicators for the targets. and. Um, uh, within the uh, pillar of data revolution, there is a, a report, I can also share it uh, with all, you all after the meeting. Um, it's a, a report on data revolution for the sustainable development goals, and it sets uh, clear requirements for the indicators that should be um, on the, I mean, should be part of the targets of the sustainable development goals. Uh, of course, because as you said, they need to be measurable, concise, clear, and so rather quantitative uh, rather than qualitative, but without, I mean, also included qualitative uh, indicators. We had a question on the side. I can't see, but I trust you. Yeah. أميرة الجمال رئيسة جمعية خطوتنا لدعم الأشخاص ذوي الإعاقات النفسية وين دور الإعاقة النفسية بالنسبة للأيام القادمة 
وعهوة ما بتعرف إنه الإعاقة النفسية عندنا مش بسهولة إنه الواحد يقدر يصرح نظرا للوصمة ومش بسهولة الأشخاص اللي عندهم إعاقات نفسية يقدروا يشاركوا بهاي الأجندة فشو رأيك؟ Thanks. The agenda is, um, is quite inclusive, but uh, as you mentioned, it does not contain all issues that uh, maybe emerged. I mean, they do not contain it in the exact title. But many, many of the issues, including disabilities and psychological disabilities, are included mainstream within some of the goals and the targets. Uh, again, can't remember them all by heart right now, but definitely in goal uh, five. Perfect. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I was just re recalling when I read the targets, and I remember that also in the employment one, for example, uh, disabilities and psychological disabilities, I suppose, are mentioned, definitely in goal five. So it is not a standalone goal, but it's rather um, mainstream within the different uh, goals and targets. Any other question? Otherwise we can uh, break for 15 minutes and then we come back focusing a little bit more on Jordan. Thank you very much for your attention. The, it's served on the other hall. Thanks. Thank